Hello, I'm Nick Clark. With crucial UN climate talks underway in Madrid, this is Planet SOS from Kenya, where climate change is being keenly felt by populations facing extreme weather and where river systems are threatened by flooding and drought. As our planet warms and waterways are contaminated, once mighty rivers have been reduced to thin stretches of water. We speak to those who say the costs downriver of a boom in hydropower are too high. Here in Kenya, we'll learn how local communities are taking the fight to save the Mara River Basin into their own hands. And halfway through COP25, the latest from those climate talks in Madrid. Welcome to Planet SOS from Kenya. The Masai Mara Game Reserve is right there, Serengeti National Park, just over the horizon in that direction. We are in the heart of the Mara River Basin, home to more than a million people and a spectacular array of biodiversity. All sustained by a crucial network of waterways, but like many lakes and rivers around the world, they're in trouble. It's predicted for each degree the Earth warms, 7% of the population will lose a fifth of their freshwater resources. Well, we've passed one degree already, and some projections show we could hit four degrees by the end of the century. That means freshwater is likely to decrease in many subtropical regions. And this is where some of the world's poorest and fastest growing populations live. People will be competing for water. Communities who rely on glaciers for freshwater will ironically get too much as they melt, but ultimately not enough. Droughts are certain to increase and demand on water supply is predicted to surpass availability in many places. And the cost of water will rise globally. The flip side is uncertain weather patterns mean more intense rainfall in short periods with potentially catastrophic flooding. Here things are being exacerbated by deforestation, overgrazing and pollution. But local communities are taking the fight into their own hands. It's a process of nature that's as old as the hills of the Mao forest, where it all begins, and the trees and plants that grow within it. The rain falls and down it percolates into the waterways and aquifers which form the Mara River Basin. The array of life here is spectacular, and in the wilderness, the iconic species of Africa, all there to be seen. At the heart of all this is the Mara River itself, in full flow during the short rainy season, but always dependent on the health of the Mao forest in the hills far away. The Mao is uh, one of the water towers within the country and it is considered a very important water catchment area, not only for the basin but the, for the entire country in general. The story has taken a new turn, as I find out. Travelling by four-wheel drive is the only way to go any distance, but in the wet season, that still presents a challenge. The route across the Mara has been destroyed by floods. Foiled by the very river that we've come to film. Now, this sort of thing happens in times of heavy rain, but it's being exacerbated by three things. First of all, deforestation upstream, then overgrazing downstream, and finally, climate change. And we've got to find another way around. Foiled again, the rains causing delays, chaos like this, becoming more frequent as the weather patterns change. You only have to look at the recent floods across the region, which have displaced thousands and have killed more than 120 in Kenya alone. And then there's drought. The Mara River nearly dried up totally earlier this year. It's never happened as far as we know, but if it did, it would be catastrophic for all that live here. We eventually make it up to the Mao Forest, where evidence of deforestation is plain to see as trees give way to farmland. The forest has reduced 60% in recent years. So there are fields like this? WWF run a program to restore the Mara River Basin. Kevin Kajanga shows us a recently harvested cabbage field. Uh, what we're looking at here is the effect of deforestation. This would have been a closed canopy forest if it was 2001. But after years of deforestation, it has been left bare. And now what's happening is agriculture. But now villagers are being encouraged to take responsibility for their environment. Village rangers help patrol for illegal logging and charcoal burning. Even dead wood that's collected from the forest floor is paid for. What's on? And at the water's edge, it's locals who are monitoring aquatic life and checking the health of the river and they know more than anyone how important it is. Because of the climate change, 
you know, sometimes we experience long dry season. That is like a wake-up call to the community. They see, okay, now there's a need to protect the small rivers we have because water has no alternative. Down on the plains, fattening up livestock has long been the Maasai way. Now they're being encouraged to reduce their herd numbers and bring their animals to market earlier to eliminate overgrazing. End result, they say, better pasture and higher yields. And here, an alternative means of income, beehives, looked after by the women of the village. This is a good thing, a way we can get some money by selling the honey. It empowers us as women and helps raise school fees for the children. The Maasai too are being encouraged to take down fences and open up their lands to more wildlife, which in itself provides tourist dollar. Not everyone here is convinced by these new ways, but the message is protecting and engaging in the environment reaps rewards for man and beast and the world we live in. Now experts are saying that the extreme weather we just saw in that report is down to a warmer than normal Indian Ocean off the coast of East Africa, causing more evaporation and therefore more rain. And that bad weather is still about and people here waiting and being delayed by a swollen tributary of the River Mara. And this kind of thing is only going to happen more and more as climate change takes a grip. OK, let's move on. Take a look at this. A third of the world's vertebrate species and half of fish species live in fresh water. Large freshwater animals have declined, though, by almost 90% since the 1970s, and the bigger fish species have seen a 94% population decline. And that's something that's relevant in Africa's largest lake, Lake Victoria. It's around about 150 kilometers away from here, a very important supply of freshwater and fish. But locals there are concerned that unless the fishing industry is protected, it could die out in a few years' time. Harry Matassa explains. John Sewale has been a fisherman nearly all his life. So was his father and grandfather too. It's how the bills get paid. But he says something's not been right for a long time on Lake Victoria. The water is warmer than years before. This is the first fish he's caught in hours. I am worried. Every time I come to fish, I catch very little. It's sad. Sometimes I don't get enough to properly take care of my family. Scientists warn life in Africa's largest freshwater lake could die if the warning signs continue to be ignored. Millions in East Africa depend on Lake Victoria. But dwindling fish stocks are being blamed on overfishing, pollution and climate change. Especially where we have issues relating to water levels receding, water levels coming lower, they expose areas where these fishes tend to breed. Fishes like tilapia, they lay their eggs in nests which are put in sand around the shores. And if the climate changes and the water recedes, those get exposed and their production is greatly impaired. Fish farming is one way of replenishing stocks for the domestic and international market. Fish are reared in cages and given food and nutrients daily. It usually takes about nine months for tilapia fish to reach maturity. Within a small shubic volume of water, we are able to get maximum productivity. Take a case of the cage you are seeing behind us. This cage has a total shubic volume of 680 uh, meters. And out of this cage, we stock 55,000 fish. With rising temperatures contributing to climate change and threatening to wipe out entire species, fish farming is being encouraged. But the cages are expensive to buy for poor fishermen. Fishing is one of Uganda's leading export earners. If the fish in Lake Victoria continue to disappear, it's not only the economy that will be devastated, but entire communities for generations to come. Harumatasa, Al Jazeera, Kampala. The UN body on climate change says that we need to halve greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2030 if we're to keep warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. It is an ambitious but necessary target. Nations have yet to step up to it. There certainly needs to be more efficient energy use and we need to make the switch to clean, green, renewable energy like wind and solar and move away from dirty energy like coal. And then there's hydropower, clean, but controversial, with potential impacts on water levels, aquatic ecosystems and people living downstream. 
In fact, the first global assessment of the world's longest rivers shows only a third still flow freely. That's largely due to thousands of dams and reservoirs. A recent WWF report says many new dams are being built without adequate account for countries and communities downriver. Now, 80% of Georgia's energy already comes from hydropower, but there are government plans to build dozens of new hydroelectric power stations. But many there are not convinced it's worth the cost, as Robin Forestier-Walker now reports. Villagers in eastern Georgia stage a sit-in against plans to build a new hydroelectric power station on the Lapota River. We have water and they want to take it away, this woman says. The company building the project says the village will get its share of water. But local lawyer Ucha tells me climate change is already affecting supply. The nature we have now won't exist anymore. Over the past summer, the water level was low and without enough moisture, trees on the left bank started to dry out. This is not my opinion. There are studies on this issue. Other affected communities are also taking action. In April, residents from nearby Pankisi battled with police over another plant. More than 50 people were injured. And on the other side of the country, in Svaneti, campaigners oppose several large projects there, one of which would force more than 2,000 people to move. Hydropower has less of a carbon footprint than fossil-fueled power stations, but studies show that even small hydropower plants disrupt the flow of rivers and damage ecosystems. Reservoir hydropower can have an even greater impact. Several new ones are under construction. This is the Jinvali Reservoir and Hydroelectric Power Station. It's one of the biggest in the country. It was built in the 1980s and it's one of a number of Soviet era plants that explain why today more than 80% of this country's electricity is generated by hydropower. Now the government wants many more new plants, both big and small, to meet growing energy demands. The government has been criticised for lacking a robust energy strategy to justify all that construction. I asked the economy minister if 119 projects scheduled were too many. The figures that you are talking about are mainly consist of these small, uh, fully merchant hydropower plants with almost zero environmental impact. Are you sure when you say that almost zero environmental impact? Any plant which is bigger than two megawatts, requires to be studied very carefully and environmental and social impact assessment should be done. Green campaigners say that didn't happen for this 187 megawatt plant, Shuachevi. Water from three rivers was diverted. One study found its construction destroyed 93 hectares of natural habitat and damaged local fish populations. The plant has been suspended. Tunnels, which were built to divert water, collapsed after it began operating in 2017. We are also experiencing other problems in other big or even small hydropower plants. Despite the legislation's requirements to do the proper assessments before starting constructions, on one hand, companies violating them. On another hand, governmental decision makers are closing eyes and just granting these permissions to the project. The company which operates the plant was not available for comment. But government and investors say that Shuachevi is an exception and that the impacts of new hydro are a price worth paying. Communities like Uchas still need convincing. Robin Forestier-Walker, Planet SOS in the Republic of Georgia. OK, so Kate Brownman is a scientist specialising in land use and water resources. And she says that while there is cause for concern, it can be a catalyst for change. I think we should worry because worry makes us think creatively and differently about solutions. But I don't think we should be afraid. One of the things that we've actually seen that I think is, is really heartening is that quite consistently, water shortage leads to cooperation not to wars, that in, in places where um, people are short of water, especially across country borders, 
that it's not fighting that we see. It's new ways of cooperating and learning to work together and really people realizing that they need to make peace in order to share these resources. Now, I just want to nudge you in the direction of some great content we've got here on Al Jazeera. This program from Earthrise is well worth a watch. The glaciers of the Indian administered region of Ladakh are shrinking as temperatures rise, causing severe water shortages there. Earthrise spoke to a man with a plan to stop the precious glacial melt from literally flowing away. Well, you can find that on aljazeera.com forward slash programs. Now to that major climate change conference in Madrid, trying to find a way forward in these uncertain times. For more on that, let's cross to Amanda in the studio. Thanks, Nick. Scientists, politicians and campaigners have gathered in their thousands in the Spanish capital for those climate talks. Whilst around the world, people have been holding rallies to draw attention to a planet in crisis and to hold decision makers to account. Teenage activist Greta Thunberg joined a mass protest in Madrid. We are in the middle of a climate and ecological emergency. And we need to start treat this crisis like a crisis. And we need to step out of our comfort zones. And that is what we are doing right now. We are stepping out of our comfort zones telling the people in power that they must take their responsibility and protect future and present generations. Well, back in the conference hall in Madrid, there are a number of critical and complex issues on the agenda. Here are some of the big ones. First, participants have to settle the rules for carbon trading, how to make polluters pay and reward those cutting back. Then there's climate finance. Developed nations are falling short of a $100 billion a year target by 2020 to help poorer nations adapt and develop in a planet-friendly way. And then there's the push led by the head of the UN, Antonio Guterres, to persuade world leaders to commit to tougher climate pledges. He described the commitments made so far as utterly inadequate. We need a rapid and deep change in the way we do business how we generate power, how we build cities, how we move, and how we feed the world. If we don't urgently change our way of life, we jeopardize life itself. The top four emitting countries account for 56% of global greenhouse gas emissions. India comes in fourth place with 7%. Now, it is working to boost its renewable power, but with nearly half its electricity dependent on coal, and a rapidly growing economy, emissions are likely to keep rising. More encouraging news from the European Union and its 28 member states. It accounts for 9% of global emissions, but it's committed to reduce that by at least 40% from 1990 levels by 2030. The US is the second largest emitter, with just over 13% of the global emissions, but its pledges, if it meets them, are deemed too low. And finally, to China, the world's top emitter. It's been investing in renewable power for decades, but 85% of its primary energy still comes from fossil fuels, and most of that is coal. With a surging economy, carbon emissions are on the rise. Rob Matheson has more from Beijing. China produces about 20% of the world's carbon emissions. Coal makes up around 59% of China's energy consumption and thick smog can still hang over Beijing in winter as people light relatively cheaper coal fires to ward off the bitter chill. But in recent years, coal mines have been closed and the building of new power plants has been restricted near heavily polluted areas. In the last couple of years, you see smog almost every day in winter. The pollution was very serious. But since last year, it's getting much better. The number of electric vehicles in China has been booming. The amount of investment that China has been making over the last seven years in renewable energy has been significant. And the pollution levels from its power stations has leveled off. But despite that, China's emissions as a whole for the first six months of 2019 rose by 4%. China's wealthy middle class is being blamed. The surge in demand for new housing and infrastructure has meant more work for China's steel and cement factories and a rise in pollution. The result of that is uh, overcapacity in industry, um, a lot of uh, questionable uh, uh, infrastructure projects in other um, areas. 
So that's the part uh, where there is space to build what you actually need, but uh, um, stop building just because you want to create demand for more steel and cement and uh, construction work. China has argued for years that it shouldn't be criticized for using coal to power its remarkable transformation into the world's second largest economy. I think China and uh, uh, at that time some other developing countries uh, believe that this is our rights to develop because they recognize that yes it's our rights to develop but on the other hand it's also about our rights for you know people's rights to breathe healthy air. The skies above Beijing may be clear more often, but while China's new middle class demand new homes, Chinese factories are likely to continue pumping out pollution. Rob Matheson in Beijing for Planet SOS. According to the latest estimates from the Global Carbon Project, CO2 emissions will hit another record high this year. And that, they say, is almost entirely due to China. Let's take a look at this week's data tracker. Scientists say the safe level for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is around 350 parts of CO2 for every million air molecules. In its recent report, the World Meteorological Organization, or the WMO, puts the average global temperature at around 1.1 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial period. It says 2019 wraps up a decade of record-breaking heat, retreating ice and rising sea levels. And finally, as you can see there, seawater is 26% more acidic, and it's because the chemistry of the water changes as the oceans absorb CO2. Thanks, Amanda. To the issue of waste now, and the world has choked with it, particularly plastic. More and more countries are beginning to regulate plastic use, but no country is taking it quite as seriously as Sweden. It's even inspired one city to recycle its image. Here's Paul Rees. This is Retuna, the world's first recycled mall. As in, everything sold here is second-hand recycled or repurposed. Manager Anna Bergström hopes it can begin to channel humanity's rampant consumerism, or at least Sweden's, in a more sustainable direction. This is the future way to run a shopping mall, I guess, and any business in the future needs to be sustainable to, to last. Eskils Tuna's waste plant processes 20,000 tonnes of rubbish a year, with smart cameras pointing different materials in the right direction. Food waste is sold back to residents as compost or used to power Eskils Tuna's buses and provide heating for the town. But there's a side project they hope will have a global impact breeding larvae from the black soldier fly as a protein source for salmon farms. So we get the protein and we get the manure from the larvae that is perfect for the improving of the soil. So it's a win-win for everyone. Retuna has also helped heal some of the hurt of Eskils Tuna's high unemployment. <laughs> I love to paint change the fittings, fix things. It's perfect for me because I've had so many jobs in my life. Now I love to work with this very old furniture. Eskils Tuna's recycled future has not replaced its former steel industry, with 15,000 still unemployed in a city of 100,000. We could just uh, lay down and, and give up, but we chose to, to not. We're still proud of being a, a manufacturing town, uh, uh, but we're also trying to find new ways and combine them with together. Green policies have given this city the chance to recycle its image after a loss of industry and identity. The question is whether it remains an outpost in the war against climate change or a blueprint for the rest of the world to adopt. Paul Rees, Al Jazeera, Eskils Tuna, Sweden. Well, we'd like to hear your stories of innovation and solutions. You can get in touch with us using the hashtag AJPlanetSOS. Next time, we're in Madrid for those climate talks, where the pressure's on to settle differences and come up with a way forward on climate change. And we talk to those who are already taking action to reduce their impact on the environment, whether the politicians agree or not. But for now, from me, Nick Clark, and the rest of the Planet SOS team here in Kenya, it's goodbye.